just as I finish that book, which is available <laughs> at the cut price of £20, I had to go for a walk. I was really exhausted. I went up the hill up towards Hampstead, walked past Air Linter Studios, and uh, Phil Todd, a sax player friend of mine, was walking in to do a session. We had a very quick chat. And I said, I've just finished a book. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. It took two years. And he said, what, to read one? Which <laughs> 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 is pretty good, I think. <laughs> My favorite musician observations are the survival ones, because we, we all have to survive against this mad world where people don't understand what musicians are or what they do. Ronnie Asprey, the late, the, sadly the late Ronnie Asprey, the sax player, was in his car one day going down Park Lane at five o'clock to get home to Brighton <clears throat> and um, he was stuck and he thought he'd move into the bus lane which is the daftest thing you could do but within seconds he's totally boxed in right next to a policeman on the pavement who comes over and, um, on the window this was a new car and Ronnie couldn't find the controls so the first thing that happens is the windscreen wipers start going <laughs> fighting away to try finally gets the window open and this policeman has that humour that some police have that they think is amusing, but isn't. <laughs> he said, is this a bus, sir? And Ronnie looked at him and said, you're new on traffic, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm about to embarrass myself here with a photo of my school band. Um, the, the twit on the left is me. And I'd made a, a pickup for this acoustic guitar out of two earphones and a soap dish. It plugged into a tape recorder. And the lead guitar player, who's 12, his amplifier was an old radio plugged into a speaker, sellotaped to a chair. <laughs> My dear friend, Ray Russell. Yeah. Very young, playing at ukulele there. Um, auditioned for Eric Delaney's band, age 15. And Ray had, was, there was a, a three steps up or down to this music uh, room where they were auditioning and he's got his guitar in one hand and amp in the other and he, he had the new Vogue Cuban heel boots <laughs> and on the steps he tripped knocking one heel off exposing just one nail sticking out which firmly embedded itself in one step <laughs> and he was too afraid to tell him what had happened so he found a socket plugged the amp in could do this and did the audition like this <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, good fun. Um, the electric guitar, we all take it for granted now, but in the very early days, no one had a clue what it meant or how it worked. And you, you often saw in the media, they thought it plugged in the wall, like this. No one knew about amplifiers. They were just existed. Francis Rossi of uh, Status Quo, he got an electric guitar in a case, and it came with all bits and pieces, one of which was the, the Jack to Jack lead. And he thought, that can't be right. So he took off one plug, put on a 13 amp. <laughs> and he said, I thought it needed time to warm up. <laughs> I don't know how people didn't kill themselves. In this Hugh Burns, on the left, who went on to play on Baker Street and lots of other big hits. His band in Scotland, they were studying music and they found this sheet and some chord names and they saw G sus. They couldn't figure out what it meant. They, they suggested sustained or suspended. And the drummer thought it meant G suspect, so you don't play it if you don't want to. <laughs> Ronnie's, I'm sure he'd been to the club. Well, uh, my first band, Affinity, we were signed to Ronnie, he was our manager, and our first gig there was supporting Stan Getz, which was fantastic. And uh, the downside was carrying a hammered organ in every bloody night, carrying it up the <laughs> stairs. That was bad news. Ronnie, I, I did like him, he was a kind of mentor, he showed you he could play beautiful music and have a good laugh at the same time. My, I think my favourite story is of, his, of Ronnie's surrealism. <clears throat> he still, you know, I mentioned earlier on the austerity, the post-war thing. He said it, his mum used to buy school clothes at the Army and Navy stores. Yeah, don't you remember the Army and Navy stores? 
he said it wasn't easy for a ten-year-old Jewish kid from the East End having to go to school dressed as a Japanese admiral. <laughs> <laughs> George Martin produced a Jeff Beck album in, in the mid-70s called Blow by Blow. It was a fine album. And Jeff was a very fussy player. He, he, he'd, he'd play something that was brilliant. He'd take a tape away, ring up George and say, I'm sorry man, I could do this again. And George would very kindly set it all up for him. He'd come back, do another solo that was equally brilliant but different. And it, over and over, for weeks, it would go on. Then there was a very big gap. And Jeff rings again, and George said this terrific line, which I, I use. He said, I'm sorry, Jeff, it's in the shops. <laughs> <laughs> this is about hotels and digs. Because the, the digs we got were inherited from the actors before, they were cheap old things. Rod Quinn, a lovely Irish drummer, he said he was at uh, breakfast and the landlady brought out a portion of honey that was like that. He said to her, I see you keep a bee. <laughs> there you go, thank you.